So we're going to start. Welcome right. to the Delling Pod with me, James Delling Pod. And I know I always say I'm excited about this week's special guest, but I really am. Um, I think this is going to be a fascinating hour or so. I have got Dr. Matthew Spaulding of Hillsdale College, which is my, which is my favourite university in America. It's the only one that hasn't been corrupted by the kind of dumbing down sort of cultural Marxism things. And I'm very good. I'm very good friends with a guy called Scott, who's a, who's a fundraiser for Hillsdale. And I've had many, many adventures. I don't know whether I have time to relate them on this occasion, but many adventures. And um, anyway, I was really pleased. I wrote a piece the other day for Breitbart about the 1776 report, of which more in a moment. And I didn't know that the guy who'd written it was, um, was Matthew Spaulding. Uh, or, were you the sole author or the co-author, Matthew? Uh, I'd probably say I was the main, uh, the main pin in the work, but we had other contributors, obviously the other commissioners, and uh, had some outside people contribute some pieces as well. But as the executive director, I put it all together and made it into what it is. Right. Okay. So let's talk first about what this thing is that I got so excited about, because just before he, just before he, he got cheated out of the election, um, President Trump put together this a sort of committee. How would you describe it? Well, so uh, I don't know how it works over there, but over here. Um, uh, there are commissions and you can have Congress can create a commission or the executive can create commissions. Yeah. So this was a commission created um, in November by the president at an advisory commission. Mm. And he issued an executive order back in November. Uh, we got uh, together. I went over there, took a leave at Hillsdale in December. And we produced a report which came out on January 19th or I'm sorry, 18th, Martin Luther King Day. Uh, a few days before the inauguration, and it was then abolished by executive order. It was, wasn't it? I mean, it, uh, it, 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 it's uh, been airbrushed <laughs> in, in true Stalin so, style. You, I that's mean, right. so, uh, so on the one hand, I was, I was never quite sure whether I should be, um, I was shocked, uh, which is an honest reaction, shocked that someone, uh, a president, could abolish a commission uh, created to advise the president and recall that it was created by one president, but we meant to advise that president or the next president, right? It's a general advisory commission. Yeah. Uh, but a, a president would abolish a commission about 1776, which is say about the founding documents. Yeah. So I was shocked by that, but I have to say that it was also, I was actually kind of honored or, or at least uh, <laughs> um, uh, pretty amazed and, and took it as a badge of, of uh, distinction that the commission was abolished the, within moments of the new the inauguration of the new president. So it really struck a nerve or hit something that caused them to uh, strike it down and remove it from the website and try as they can to erase it completely, to yeah. disappear. I, I guess that you probably haven't considered yourself before as a dangerous radical. You probably thought you were quite uh, straight down the line. No, as, as, as a matter of fact, I'm, I'm struck by the fact that a lot of the history in this work is, is, is uh, the other commissioners I have talked about. I mean, this is the kind of thing we've been writing for the last 30, 40 years of our lives about American history and the founding, the founding principles in Lincoln and Martin Luther King and Frederick Douglass. And, and the notion that somehow those things, which heretofore were not radical at all, these are mainstream arguments yeah. uh, in, in this country, um, Mainstream markets now they're radical not to the point that the that the press has immediately labeled them as being either extremely questionable, hateful, and and potentially just on their face racist. And yeah, I, I say I was I was rather shocked by that the 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 quickness with which it went directly to the jugular in that way, and there really was no substantive debate. And then the it's immediately abolished. Yeah, and removed from the website. I just uh, I was I was. <laughs> I was shocked, but it, but again, it's, there, there's something um, uh, noteworthy to to have that you know for the for the president of the United States to think that somehow in his first moments of office, in his top dozen or so executive orders, um, he needs to get rid of this thing. That, that's pretty amazing. Well, I think he did us all a favor, President Biden, and I think he's or or rather his fraudulence, President Biden, because. I think that actually he is doing 
the Lord's work by showing just how dangerous and un-American the, the liberal left has become recently, to the point where they effectively airbrush from history the foundational texts of the American Republic. I mean, what I, what I liked about you, you know, like a lot of English people, I, I, I have an idea about checks and balances. I've heard of some of the founding fathers and stuff, but it's quite complicated American politics and, and, and the constitution yeah. and stuff. So I've, I've, it, it's, it's a bit like, you know, Sanskrit, you know, to me, my, my, my working knowledge of Sanskrit is really quite, <laughs> quite limited. And it's the same, same, same with this. But what I loved about your report, the 1776 report, was that it explained in an intelligent, but not too complicated way, why your constitution matters, why the Declaration of Independence matters. And having read your document, I ended up feeling envious of you Americans because I'd always thought that you Americans were like, you know, I love America and I love Americans, but kind of you weren't, you, you didn't win the lottery in life. You weren't born British. Um, and I thought, I kind of thought our system was better because we had Magna Carta, we had right, right. Parliament, we've got English common law and all this stuff, which just as you Americans have been brought up to admire your constitution, we in our country feel slightly superior about our way. You know, we don't need a written constitution, unlike those, those upstart Americans. But actually, I thought... Your constitution, your declaration is a thing of beauty. And just before I, I give you a chance to speak, what I really liked about your report, this is, this is a bit you, you said at the end, you said, to be an American means something noble and good. It means treasuring freedom and embracing the vitality of self-government. We are shaped by the beauty, bounty, and wildness of our continent. And it goes on like this. But, You've got freedom at the heart of everything that, that, that America stands for. I, I simply cannot imagine any, say Boris Johnson put together a committee now to, to, find, to, to try and decide what, where Britain's future lay. It would come up with hogwash like diversity and sustainability right. and all manner of crap. Whereas you guys can go back to what the, what the founding fathers said in, in the late 18th century, and this is what America still stands for or ought to stand for. Right. So um, uh, to go back to your general theme here, I, I, I loved your piece. And the reason I loved it was in the same way you could say right now where, you're, where, where, England, where, where, where Britain is, you're ashamed to be British. Uh, I can say right now, um, especially by just the way you pointed it out, I'm, I'm very proud to have uh, uh, many of, you know, America's ideas, you know, had their origins in the development, the long development of the British rule of law, going back yes. to Magna Carta for that matter. Yeah. Um, there's a great overlap here, which I think we're both uh, recognizing uh, in a sense, which is there's a, there's a greater question about what are the roots? What are the, the deep philosophical roots of Western civilization? Yeah. And in America, that comes out um, through the, uh, that the, 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 the American Revolution or that, uh, that controversy that we had uh, in the past mm. um, that is explained in the Declaration and develops and becomes the Constitution. But, you know, there's a, there's a sense here that, um, or actually, uh, there, there is uh, the argument here that in writing the Declaration, um, it doesn't come out as much in the report, but I would say that the, the arguments of the Declaration were really appealing, if you will, um, uh, kind of behind the immediate arguments of, of uh, you know, 18th century British understandings of time to these deeper roots uh, of, the, of the common law and Magna Carta and really the higher law uh, tradition that I think we, uh, we continue. Uh, but having said that, I think the uh, the real question here, the one that you allude to in your article, and that we worry about here, is um, you know, uh, do what are the things that particular regimes hold uh, to be true? What, what are their 
principles behind them. Mm. Um, you know, what we worry about is the extent to which uh, really America, America becomes just kind of a, a popular fad of the moment and loses its, its self-understanding of rights grounded in nature that is something beyond the regime, that rights are not merely the gift of government, uh, whether it's the Supreme Court or whatever it might be, or, or merely tradition, but that the American tradition really reaches back to a, a deeper understanding that gives you a true mooring uh, for your politics. And I think that's, that's something that modern liberalism, both here and, and I, I think abroad as well, uh, has kind of severed that relationship. And as a result, we start looking for sources of rights elsewhere. We start looking to kind of popular movements uh, for importance. And, and next thing we know, our values are whatever is the popular issue of the day, whether it's uh, uh, you know, uh, the environment or uh, these ideas of equity and equal outcomes. Yeah. Um, those are all political questions we can argue and debate about, but you've really lost the heart of the matter uh, which is what is the legitimate grounding of, of rights, which is to say, what's the legitimate grounding of your freedom? Uh, because if you lose that grounding, then freedom really is, is controlled by different groups. And then the question is, what group is in control? And that's something that our report gets at a lot and has kind of caused some controversy, I suppose. But once you start talking about group rights, there are more and less barbaric versions of that. But Group rights usually lead to outcomes which some groups win and some groups lose. Yeah. And we think that's not, that's not American to put in our context, but more generally, that's not, uh, the, the, that's not a, a way of living, a way of governing, uh, a regime principle in which all equally share in that liberty. Yeah. And that's a great concern of ours. I, I think there's no question that if America can find a way of recovering or cleaving to the principles established in the Declaration of, of, of Independence and then later in the, in the Constitution, it will be prosperous, happy, successful. I mean, it, it, it would be the magic bullet, would it not? Now, do you think, do you think that one of the reasons that America became so great that it was very, very lucky in having these principles established at almost exactly the right time in history. I mean, we're talking about the peak of the Enlightenment, aren't we? And we're talking about you had some really clever guys um, framing the Constitution who also they came from the sort of European intellectual tradition, didn't they? I mean, were any of them born in, in Europe or were they all Americans? Uh, some of them were, were, were born, uh, in Europe. Most of them, almost all of them were born, uh, born here at that point. Right. Uh, but it, it's, it's very clear that the, um, and one distinction I'll, I'll make here, especially for, 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 for this conversation is, uh, we need to recognize the extent to which the, the enlightenment as it comes to America, uh, it's not the French enlightenment. We, we got to make a clear distinction here. It really is that enlightenment that goes through England, right? It's, it's the moderate enlightenment. It's, it's the, the enlightenment of, of, of John Locke and, and uh, Edmund Burke and Adam Smith, right? It's, it's a different kind of enlightenment. And then you add to that, I think, the unique um, uh, attributes in the American colonies. Uh, and there's an appendix in the report that talks about this, of the, this question about uh, reason and revelation. Right, that this was a major theme, religious, the rise of religious liberty. And if you add that to their understanding of the Enlightenment, you get a, a very um, a, a, a moderate sense of, uh, of the Enlightenment a la John Locke. Uh, but you also get a very robust moral uh, grounding, if you will, in, uh, in, in kind of the revelatory tradition, the biblical Christian tradition. Uh, but also in a kind of a, a, a classical uh, reasoning uh, sense. Uh, and it was seen that these things were compatible. And you put those together, and that created this unique environment uh, for the, uh, the, the American founding. I think the other thing, and I'd be interested in your thoughts on this as well, is, is you know, if you're looking at, you, you raised this question about 
what does this mean for where America is as opposed to where Britain is right now and how they are going to relate to their particular regimes. There is something particular about America, which is why a 1776 commission can be created in the first place, and then why it's controversial, is that everything about American politics, just it's, it's the way it's constructed, the Constitution, our, our first law is our highest law, everything points back to our beginnings um, in, in a way. That, so, that, so this country really always is looking back. So American politics on the left and the right are always debates about that. So you know, Barack, Barack Obama talks about, has to talk about the Declaration of Independence. Um, you know, FDR and the New Deal looks back to the, to the founding. Obviously Ronald Reagan, uh, this commission, the 1619 Project, we're always arguing about our beginning. Yeah. And so there's, there's something in the structural design of America that also points back to those things, which is why our politics really circles, turns on, on these questions. And we keep coming back to them. Well, I, I, look, I think the, um, the, 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 the cynical British answer would be, yeah, well, of course you keep looking back because you're desperate to have some history given that you've got so little <laughs> of it. I mean, you know, I've been to your, I've been to your oldest town. I think it's St. Augustine in Florida, something like that. And you know we're we're, right. we're talking 16th century, or, uh, uh, and it's pathetic. You know we've got we've got Stonehenge, but 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 I think the the, the less cynical answer is is actually um, we too until recently looked back on our past um, with you know, we were proud of our past, and it was very interesting. I don't know whether you whether you were aware of this terrible speech. Tony Blair, I think, was one of the worst things. He was our equivalent, I think, to Barack Obama. Um, much, much more dangerous than has ever been properly acknowledged. And I think future historians are going to look back and say, you, they, were, they, they really were big evil. They, they really did more damage to their country than almost anybody. Um, Tony Blair made a famous speech in which he said, Britain is a young country. In other words, he was trying to create a kind of year zero in which it, it, it rejected right. all our traditions, all our, our, our heritage to create this sort of social justice, equality, sustainable right. diversity, morass that we're, we're all, ex the left would like to impose on us give it, give it, given half the chance. And I think, right. as I said in my article, I envy you Americans being able to go back to your, your constitution and saying, look, this is who we are. Whereas we, we could do that with Magna Carta and we, we, we try occasionally um, and we, we, we try and put, ooh, English common law, isn't it great? You know, case law, it's, 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 right. it's, it's, it's an evolving process and, and, you know, a combination of sort of custom and, 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 and progress. But actually what we've both found in your country and in my country is that in your country the checks and balances only work and in my country this kind of living constitution this unwritten constitution only work if people act with integrity according to their particular roles within it so for example you've got your supreme court well there was a time when the supreme court was actually a thing worth being elevated to but look at what it's just done with Trump. It's just gone and it went and washed its hands of its obvious responsibilities to answer these questions. You know, it was to do with, it was clearly an issue involving the states because some states had been cheated out of their votes by this, this corrupt voting machine and, and so on. It was obvious that the SCOTUS should have intervened. It didn't because it was corrupt. We've seen the states sort of washing their hands of their of their responsibilities towards ensuring that the election was conducted fairly. We've seen, well, that the media is not part of your your checks and balances, but we've seen the media fail as well. Same in my country. I I cannot now trust our courts to dispense justice. I cannot trust our politicians to be uncorrupt. And okay, in the 18th century, the rotten boroughs, you know. The po MPs were deeply corrupt then. But I don't think that we've ever had a time in our history, certainly in modern history, where our politicians have failed to this degree. Um, I've got more hope for America than I have for my country, precisely because of your, of your written constitution. Do you think that's um, a, a reasonable point to make for a, an Englishman? No, I, I, I think it is, but I think the... Um... 
uh, it really is in, in, in America, it's the combination of having that written constitution, which I mean, for the record is, you know, large segments of, the, of our written constitution really are inherited from British constitutionalism. Yeah, I'll be the first to admit that. But I think what, what the Americans did uh, really was twofold. One is we wanted a written constitution, which turns out it's probably a, a good thing that we have that. Yeah. <laughs> we insisted on that. Damn uh, right. Number one. But the, the, the American constitutional system, the written constitution, uh, what, what allows us to continue having this debate to prevent our constitution from merely becoming a living constitution which is really what modern liberalism is, is yeah. wanting to do, right? Uh, whether it was, and this has been going on for some time, right? The, the idea of a living constitution, uh, deconstructing the constitution, yeah. uh, finding things in various penumbras and emanations and whatever it might be. Um, but the thing that prevents that, which is I think why this report is so quote unquote controversial is that American constitutionalism the idea that you're equal before the law, that you have due process, that the structure of the constitution matters, all of that turns philosophically on the declaration. If the declaration says, as a matter of principle, not as a matter of mere, mere claim or tradition or something that happened in the 18th century, what we're, if the declaration says that as a matter of principle, grounded in the laws of nature and nature's God, which say it's a self-evident truth, all men are created equal, which say so you have the a, a philosophical mooring to keep that constitutional system rooted uh, that prevents it from floating down the path. And that's why we emphasize so much the, the, the importance of, look, friends, if you're interested in uh, limited constitutionalism, checks and balances, getting the legislative, judicial, and executive branch back to some sort of norm as they should act properly. Um, uh, the, the key here really is getting back to a proper understanding of, of 1776, the philosophical grounding, yeah. um, which is also why uh, going, you know, the, the debate right now uh, in, in American history, uh, the, the, the um, progressive, American progressive movement, uh, but also John C. Calhoun, the great defender of human slavery, all of them, all of them, saw that they needed to attack the Constitution, but more importantly, they needed to attack the Declaration of Independence. They had to go after the philosophical grounding of the American founding. And that's what they all have in common. They all led to different things. They're, you know, one of, you know, human uh, slavery is much more barbaric than the current debate over identity politics uh, and, and what's going on in terms of equity politics and whatnot. But having said that, they all share the philosophical point uh, which is they must uh, question the claim of human equality. That is that we all possess the same rights by nature and we all have the equal status and, uh, before the law. It's based on our consent. None, none is, has more rights than the other. Uh, and they have, to, they have to attack that. So the, 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 the grounding behind constitutionalism, I think, is the, is the key to why uh, America has, has had this great success but also right now, how that keeps the constitutional system rooted uh, and, and but why that is the controversial question. You notice that in the debate over the report, um, it's, it's centered around you know, uh, the question about slavery, uh, but, but it's also this claim, uh, you know, a lot of the criticisms just could not relate to this claim. Um, the report approaches these questions as, as one, one, of, one of the critics said, as if they were true. <laughs> that is, that is the, the American proposition is either true or it's not true. Yeah. If it's, and if it's not true, then human equality and, and liberty and consent and all that is out the window. Yeah. Uh, well, that is, either, that is the case or it's not the case. Let's start at that substantive question. But instead, they want to talk about other things. But, you know, what is issue here? The report reminds Americans that 1776 is what we what we nowadays call truth claims, um, but it it's it's a it's a philosophical claim, not something the Americans made up. Um, I mean, we can go that we can go back to Blackstone and other thinkers, you know, in you know, long tradition going back to the ancients even. Uh, but the American regime is based on that truth. It, either that's true or it's not true. 
tell me tell me about I, I mean I wish we had three hours because because I'm finding this this conversation this subject very interesting in fact I kind of like I kind of like my kids to go to Hillsdale to to, to have this experience <laughs> I think it'd be very interesting um because it's like you, you do offer the, the kind of rigorous education that has been pretty much pretty much written off by the academic mainstream do you not know think yeah, no, absolutely. So that's why. So behind all this, of course, is a great debate about about what is history. I mean, you know, modern uh, the modern uh, modern liberalism, the modern project, I mean, the, the modern radical project, which yeah. you suffer from just as much as we suffer from, is that um, history is not about knowledge, right? History uh, and, and education is not a a search for the truth. It's not us looking at great things like. Um, um, you know, the political history, but also great literature like Shakespeare or our great political thinkers going back to the ancient, right? That's not what education is about because that stuff's not worth studying. Um, the question, it's always the, the, the current, the, the, the most recent, what do we think now? There's no looking back to what, what experience has taught us, but more importantly, what intel the, the, the kind of the great course of, of, of human events, as it says at the beginning of our declaration, the, yeah. uh, the course of human events has learned about the truths of the human condition. Um, that's not what modern education is about, which is why they've attacked this report, because it has nothing to do with history in their sense. Yeah. Um, we think that's a just complete destruction and denial of what history actually is. Um, we think history is about facts. It's about uh, learning the good, the bad, and the ugly. But when you do that is when you see that in our history, as I would suggest in British history or whatever history we, we look at, right? Uh, there are clearly flaws and problems and characters that are despicable. Yeah. Um, but you also realize that there's a, great, there's a great nobility in the history because there are great noble figures in history who are trying to live up to uh, the particular principles and the ideals of that of that regime in terms of, in our case, founding a country and based on human equality, uh, bringing it into actual existence, making these abstract principles, that, as Lincoln called them, actual uh, reality in an actual country. Yeah. And when you look at it that way, American history looks very different as opposed to um, modern historians, which all they want to do is look back they see bad things, they see things like slavery, and so they want to throw it all out and start over again. The kind of going coming back to you know starting history at zero, as you uh, earlier said. Yeah, uh, that's that's the problem we have today. Yeah, we, we've got we've got a similar movement in the UK. Um, I actually, I think probably the, the phrase comes from America, doesn't it? Decolonize the curriculum. It's um, yeah, right. you know it probably does. <laughs> Uh, we're probably feeding bad things back to you now. So you, you've got universities like Oxford and Cambridge, which you may have heard of. I mean, they used to have quite a reputation, but I, I'm not sure why. I, I mean, honestly, given the, given the choice between Oxford, Cambridge and Hillsdale, I think you, you get a much better better education at Hillsdale. I, and, and I think it's sad that that is the case. But right. it there is it is. It's, it's, it's very sad. It's, it's, it's patently obvious it's the truth, however. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it really is, isn't yeah. it? Uh, and it's not because we somehow discovered something that wasn't known. It's just that so much of uh, modern universities and the modern educational system has has rejected its own great accomplishments. Yeah. And uh, places like Hillsdale and a few others, we're not the only ones, but we're, the, we're, we're up, up front and forward about it, have, uh, have maintained these older uh, traditions and uh, how to study things. We actually think it's still worth reading uh, great literature and great books and studying history and political thought. Uh, and that that is actually liberating as in the, the meaning of the word liberal education. We actually are liberal in that sense. Yes. Uh, that, that that frees the mind to come to, to learn things. You can still disagree. You can still dislike um, uh, things in America's past. Uh, you can still, as we do, uh, condemn slavery. Frederick Douglass spoke on our campus twice. I mean, you know, Hillsdale College is, was an abolitionist college in the 19th century. It's formed by, you know, as an abolitionist college. Yeah. Um, that is all true. But the way you teach these things, the way you study these things, is you approach them 
uh, uh, on these, uh, that you might learn something from them and they have something to teach you about the truth. Uh, the truth of the human condition, its, its flaws, its imperfections, but also its ability to, uh, to achieve great things, to learn, to see great things, to see uh, you know, beauty and wisdom. And, and that's how we approach it. And that's, I would say, how you know, all of your great educational institutions used to approach it. Yeah. Um, so I got I got distracted then because I guess because you've, you you your your voice is you you frozen and you disappeared. Um, but maybe um, maybe it'll come back. <laughs> oh dear. No, I just. I hate my my Wi-Fi so much. Mm -hmm. Oh, hello, are you there, Matthew? Can you hear me? I, I, I can hear you fine. Oh, good, excellent. Anyway, um. I, I think one of the sneaky the sneaky things the founding fathers did. In fact, just just before before we get, we go on, you, you give me an idiot's guide to the founding fathers. I've I've read, I've read. Um, I'm a big fan of Jefferson's second um, what's it called inaugural inauguration speech. Fantastic. Right. Just, I love the way he sets out how how to avoid tyranny, how to avoid how to, how to get a pros prosperous come. Who 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 should. Who are the really cool guys among your founding fathers? Who should who who should I, I worship? Well, that's that's always a hard question. Um, uh, I, I actually think the greatest of, of the founders was was. Uh, can I close it up again? No, I can hear you. Okay, okay. Um, I, I actually think the greatest of the founders was uh, George Washington, uh, for for a couple of reasons. One is he was always he was always the adult in the room. Um, his disposition was always uh, very conservative in that sense, but he, he understood the principles uh, as well as anybody else, uh, and he made the thing happen. So there's, there's you know, if, he really embodies the principles of the founding, but he's the great statesman, right? He, he is the, the classical sense of the founder. Um, uh, I, I like a lot about Jefferson, but Jefferson can get kind of squirrely uh, in a lot of his ideas. What, what, what is uh, that? Madison is great. Uh, well, he's you know he's um, uh, he's a beautiful writer. Uh, he's you know, these are the axioms of uh, of free society as Lincoln called them. Uh, but he can be too enamored by the Enlightenment sometimes. Okay, right. Uh, and kind of get carried away by it. Um, and so I it's like it's it's always good to have Jefferson, but then offset by say a John Adams or. The way in which Madison was was even though he, he was on the same party as, as Jefferson, uh, offset Jefferson as well. Uh, so it's the, the mix of them really is the miraculous thing. I think they came together, and, and in that sense, uh, Washington is great because he really embodied the, the range of the founders, and yet he was the practical statesman who actually brought it into existence. Do you know that the Washington's family home is fifteen miles from where I live, so, so, right? ah. Soulgrave Manor? And in, in my church, there are the stained glass windows of the Washington family taken from Salgrave Manor. And that says Washington and light with an E. And you can also see the origins of the stars and striped flags, which I think were inspired by Washington's family crest. Anyway, that's just a digression for you. I thought you'd be interested. Yeah, um, yes, I am, that's, that's great. Um, you meant, oh, yes, I know what I was gonna say. One of the sneaky things that the founding fathers did was uh, and, and I think that modern governments who are uh, tend to be authoritarian um, and constricting don't like this at all. They made liberty a very key part of your of your essence, if you like. Um, tell me a bit right. about that. Well, I, I don't know if it was sneaky. I think that um, uh, although I like sneaky things, I suppose uh, you're absolutely right. And um, uh, remember what they, what the objective here. So the, 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 the in broad terms, the enlightenment is bringing more tolerance, the rule of law, uh, constitutionalism. Uh, this is all kind of being carried over, especially through the English tradition into America. What, what's the purpose of that tradition? It, it is to expand human liberty, which also means expanding uh, economic opportunity, um, uh, decreasing, you know, uh, repression, especially religious uh, uh, repression, 
uh, allowing for um, uh, the spread of wealth as opposed to keeping it in particular families and aristocracy. Um, and so for the Americans, that, that really is the, the, the central question. Uh, so in the Declaration it speaks of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Well, what's, what's the short term for all of that, right? It's, it's, it really is liberty. Yeah. Um, and the other thing I always like to point out is in, in the, the Americans, they, in America, have two words in English, we have two words for, for this, which is liberty and freedom. Yeah. Uh, freedom is a much more modern word. It's actually Germanic in its origins. Uh, liberty, which is the word the founders actually use almost exclusively, is, a, is an old Latin word. Um, and, you know, it's, it, it has some implications. What it's a liberty is, is that liberty which is appropriate for man, right? As opposed to freedom, which could be anything. Something like waving in the, in the wind is free. Yeah. It's free of constraint. That's an, that's an aspect of it, but liberty is a much more robust word. Uh, and I guess to how they understood it, which is there's something appropriate for the human person, uh, which is a full flourishing of the human person requires liberty so that you can have your, your own life, your own property, um, uh, your own, um, uh, pursue your own interests and opportunities, uh, but also uh, have and, and express your religious liberty. There's a whole range of things that are appropriate for human beings, and they use the term liberty to describe them. That's what really, in that sense, the end of what they're trying to accomplish. Yeah. I suppose the reason I'm dwelling on this sort of nostalgically and slightly mournfully uh, is that we live, in, we live in times where no one talks about it. I've never heard anyone in our government in the UK talk about liberty not 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 the conservatives it ought to be in their dna and they don't talk about it at all it's extraordinary yeah no, I, I was i, I was uh, you know so I, I read your piece which i thought was delightful um but that that was the one thing that really struck me because of course you know here that's still an important term of of uh, much of our politics yeah is this idea of liberty uh, but you're right, it's, you know, with the lockdowns and different things, the rise of the modern government and administration, uh, it's become less so, but you, you really kind of pointed that out in the, in, the, in the British context, which I think should give us some pause uh, to think about, you know, wh where is this all going? Um, is, is liberty still the end of all this, or is merely uh, more efficient government, uh, better administration, uh, you know, what is it? <laughs> and and no. of course, that's what kind of the American progressive left sees as the objective. And I think on that front, you, you, you guys are much farther ahead of us than, uh, than where we are. Yeah, right I know. We used, to, we used to get all our bad ideas from you, and it now seems like, like it's the role is reversed. We are now the, the fonz et origo of, of all manner of tyrannical stupidity. Right. But I think, you know, I think, look, I think God used to be an Englishman. I think probably he is American now. And I just, I, I don't know about you, Matthew, I'm feeling oddly optimistic about things. I mean, I, I see, for example, America is not accepting the stolen, stolen presidency at all. They're not, they're not buying it. He's kind of a dead man walking, I think. I mean, in the metaphorical sense, I'm not suggesting he's going to get, well, he's probably going <laughs> to succumb to Alzheimer's sooner or later. But, but I mean, I don't get the sense that this is this is the end of America. I, 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 I'm sensing a kind of a rebirth. Do you feel any of that optimism? Well, I, I, um, uh, I, I think the answer to that is, is, is yes. Uh, and I think it actually has less to do with the immediate events of last you know, few months. Um, and it has to do with something even, even deeper and more profound, which gives me perhaps even more optimism, uh, which is, look, if the, if the American founders were right, or put it more broadly, if the long train of Western civilization is correct, yeah. then there are certain inherent truths in human nature. And, and one of those truths is that the human beings really don't like to be ruled, especially ruled against their will. Um, yeah. That became a, that was the, the British tradition ran with you know <laughs> recognize that which is why when they went around the world they spread the rule of law as opposed to the rule of men. Yeah, uh, the Americans put that in in in, in principled form and in their embedded it in their constitution. 
But if that's a truth of human nature, then there's always a, 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 an optimistic core there. And I think in the American context, um, setting aside current, current office holders or the particulars of this election or that election, you can really go back throughout our history, especially the 20th century with the rise of this thing called conservatism, uh, with, with the, the movements like the Tea Party, with this phenomena that gave rise to uh, Trumpism, uh, there's a lot of um, uncomfortableness with the rise of modern administrative politics. Yeah. Uh, and I think a lot of Americans in both political parties and across the spectrum don't see that as being the, uh, the true expression of American liberty. How that plays out, I don't know. Uh, but I think that this question will continue for some time. Uh, and I think that if there's, if I have optimism about American politics, it's really grounded in the fact that there's something about American politics, again, going back to its founding and these principles that can't merely be erased. Yeah. Uh, try as they will, try as they will for the last hundred years, they can't get rid of them. Uh, and I think Americans still kind of have a sense of that. And the question is how they, uh, how they how they understand that how to what extent do they understand it how they're going to teach it to their children and 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 what how that plays out in our politics yeah do you sense that there is a starting to be a backlash in academe i mean the your um your ivy league universities are just as prey to this social justice, snowflakery, et cetera, that, that has afflicted our universities. Uh, and I think if I were the parent of American, an, American, an American parent of a university aged child, I would feel no more enthusiastic about, about um, Ivy Leagues than I do about Oxbridge. Do you get any sense that, I mean, places like Hillsdale, and you say there are others, or that there's gonna be a, a yeah, a backlash? Well, I, I think you're right in the sense that uh, so much of this really grows out of the universities. The universities, I, I'm, I suppose I'm less, pes uh, less optimistic about than, than politics. Because at least in politics, people can still vote and participate in elections and, and uh, be actually involved in things, at least you know, uh, thus, thus far. Uh, but the, 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 the academy with, with uh, tenured professors and, and large endowments it really is hard to push back against this. Um, but, you know, I, I am struck and, and, and I have a little bit of optimism, perhaps, that there are historians uh, that have come out and criticized some of this. Uh, you know, they criticized the 1619 Project and Howard Zinn and some of the radical elements of, of his, the kind of ideological historicism. Um, it's hard to see, but it, it's there. But at, at the end of the day, I think... Um, to the extent that there's going to be a Amer an American renewal, it's going to come from uh, families teaching their children, uh, and it's going to come up through politics. Uh, my, my, you know, maybe it's, you know, state politics, local politics, and eventually kind of in national politics as well. The question here is, is what, where are the American people on this question? Remember, uh, America right now is closely divided. The, the uh, Republicans picked up more seats in the House. The Senate is 50-50. Uh, this was actually a pretty close presidential election uh, in which, you know, what over 70 million people voted for each, each of the two candidates. I mean, this is not, this is not, does not suggest a, a, a people, a voting people who have settled this question uh, one way or the other. Um, and so now we're going to have a, a, a discussion, which I'm optimistic, uh, we'll have to go back and, and uh, rethink and re, uh, reconsider who we are in light of our core principles. And that's what the report was meant to do, put a marker down that in this conversation, this is the other, this is the other way of thinking about it. Um, where, where, where do we stand? And, and I think we're now going to have to have that conversation. Yeah. Do you think, can you, I mean, I, I, I think I'm, I'm slightly less, I, I'm slightly more skeptical of, of that, that sort of 50 50 divide than you than you claim to be Fair enough. Yeah. um in, in fact i believe that the trump won an overwhelming number of votes and and that this has been suppressed by your incredibly corrupt disgustingly corrupt system um do, do you 
if I'm right, and of course I am, um, can you see the possibility that there might be um, the kind of the red states will secede from that there will be a new division in America? I mean, I, I, I could see Texas, Florida, a few of those states saying, well, if, if they persist with this um, corrupt liberal left hegemony, we want no part of it. And, it, and, and we're going to have to cut loose and go our own way. Is that possible? Um, uh, well, I mean, I, I, mean I, I, I suppose in a general way, all, all things are, are possible. Yeah, and, right. and, and given, given where things have been going last in, in politics, I, I, I make no predictions because I can't. I mean, yeah. you know, uh, and having said that, I think the, um, you know, I think we need to, to kind of look back, kind of take a broader perspective here. I mean, the, um, I think we're, we're, we're divided intellectually. I think there are very deep divisions, uh, which clearly now go back to these core principles. Um, but I don't think we've kind of crossed a Rubicon uh, where the only option is to, is to break up. I, I pray that we haven't. I don't think that's happened. I think it's, you know, these things come up. There, people like to talk about all, all these kinds of scenarios. Uh, but I think the the one another aspect that we have going for us, uh, in addition to these these core principles which we always go back to, is the strong sense um, both on the left and the right that we are one nation. Uh, we actually do, despite our having a a brief history of you as you have made uh, imminently clear in the scheme of things. Yeah, <laughs> we do have a history of being a union. And I think that um, uh, the, the American people, even the, the, the division about these uh, these principles, especially in intelligentsia, um, I, I think the vast majority of the American people, if framed correctly, uh, support these principles. Uh, but I also think the vast majority of the American people uh, love their country and love this, this union. And uh, it would be... Um, a, a terrible loss to kind of go down that path uh, without thinking uh, thinking this through. So you, so my hope is that there will be a okay. Let's let's we don't want to go there. Let's back up. Let's think about this. But in doing that, you've got to go back and, and to address uh, these core principles. And there, you've got to actually we've got to allow for the ability for uh, these principles to express their, the, themselves in our politics. Uh, because I think there is a uh, woman majority that would want to save this country based upon uh, its most fundamental principles. And, you know, how that gets expressed, when, how long does it take? Uh, that's, that's another question, I suppose. Uh, but I, I think that think that this report, which, you know, the abolition of which has, has caused a lot of interest in it, they, they've done by trying to erase it. Uh, suggests that there are still lots of American people out there. I think overwhelming numbers of American people who who have not accepted uh, the radical claim that we should merely throw these away and start over. Again. Well, Matthew, I totally agree with you on the bit about most Americans want America to be united and believe in the Constitution and believe in 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 all the all the principles outlined therein in the Declaration of Independence. That that's a given. That is absolutely a given. But at the risk of calling you Pollyanna, <laughs> I can, I can, yeah, you only have to look at, look around the world now or in re recent history. You think about what happened in uh, Rwanda with the Hutus and the Tutsis, where you had this minority um, tribe, which was yet the ruling, the ruling class. You think of the, um, what's the ruling tribe in Nigeria? There's one kind of governing governing tribe, um, the, the Hutus, I think. No, sorry, sorry the, um, the um, it'll come to me in a moment. Yeah, it's the Yoruba, the, the Igbo, and, and what's the other one? The Hausa. The Hausa uh, yeah. tend to be the ones that, that, that dominate the military. You, you, you think of um, Syria. You know, you think of you think of the of the Baathist and the and and the Assad family again. There, the, the Alawites are are, are a, a minority, and yet they have they have the political power. It seems to me that you have something similar going on in America right now. 
you have a narrow elite which has been trained in woke at these uh, and 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 submitted to all these kind of um sinister um uh, uh rituals with skull and bones and stuff you've got this kind of effete corrupt um political class which has completely lost touch with the the principles of the constitution and stuff none you know your 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 judiciary are bent as a nine bob note as far as i can see i see very little sign you've got a functioning judiciary they they're deeply corrupt your politicians a, a, a lot of them are in the pay of the Chinese Communist Party. I mean, I find this extraordinary. It, it is an orgy in stables in, in, in the, at the political level. I do not see how this can have a happy, happy conclusion. I, I do not, because the people, we the people, do not share their values. And yet, and yet it seems to me they've got the power, the, 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 this corrupt class. So explain that. Well, no. Fair enough, um, and I don't necessarily disagree. I mean, the, the notion <laughs> of a, a, a corrupt elite, uh, I think that's absolutely right. And I think that's what um, the last, you know, 30, 40, you know, 50 years really has been a, a slow but growing boil on, on the part of the American people to object to that kind of rule. Yeah. Um, I, I'm just putting it in a broader context. I, I, I don't think, I think the debate in America really is between uh, the elite, which exists in both political parties, for sure, and uh, has a lot of corruption within it, uh, and the American people. Uh, my point is that the American people, I don't think, have divided into tribes, to use your historical examples of other countries, yeah. uh, to the extent that they're, they're no longer capable of living together. They have deep divisions. Don't, don't, uh, don't misunderstand me there. But I don't think we have become tribes in the sense that we are capable of being one nation. Uh, and I think to go to, to go back to your point, which we which we agreed on, is is that it's precisely because the American people, despite those disagreements, the overwhelming majority, setting aside the elite university. Look, I guess my my point is I, I'm I'm in agreement with you that there's um, uh, America's problem. Uh, its crisis, if you will, is it's being ruled by a, uh, a an elite coming out of the universities, within our politics, uh, controlling media, all those things you described earlier, and there are a lot of corruptions in it. But what, what gives me some optimism is I think there are also a lot of signs that the American people, uh, whether it's whether we're narrowly divided or more broadly divided, however you want to put it politically, uh, I think there's a... Uh, overwhelming majority of them who still believe this is a good country, uh, that it's it, it should remain a union, and that when it comes down to it, the principles upon which we're founded were, were, were in 1776. Uh, it's flawed, it's imperfect, but uh, it's, it's, it's got a noble history of trying to live up, live up to them. So I think there's this disjunct, almost two regimes, if you will. There's this elite regime that we uh, dislike, and I think it's being fought over, and currently um, is is in is really dominant uh, and in, in control. But I think there's plenty of signs out there that that the American people have not settled their opinions on this on this question. And and uh, I think the right response to that is well, how do they how do they express those opinions in a way that will save this country? The other great tradition we have now, granted, we've we've had a civil war and there was we had a fight over secession. Uh, but I would say the stronger tradition in America, uh, the, the, the tradition you see in all the great reform movements, whether it's Martin Luther King's civil rights movement, uh, women's suffrage, abolition, is, is a movement to save America by going back to its beginnings. Yeah. And in that sense, that's the kind of populist movement I think we need here. And then I would argue that we see, we've seen in Trumpism, but before the Tea Party movement, and really going back to Reaganism mm -hmm. in the 1980s, um, that is by no means gone as much as its critics want to erase that. Uh, there's still, you know, 70 plus million people uh, who did not choose the current direction we're going in. And that tells me something uh, about where they are, uh, given the fact that I would say that recent politicians in both, in both political parties, um, even though I like uh, 
uh, Mr. Trump's positions a lot better. It's not that they were perfect in their way either. And yet, despite that, millions and millions, tens of millions of, of American people uh, voted for him a second time uh, to, con to continue the direction of the country. Yeah. Um, that doesn't strike me as we're about to break up and become multiple unions and have secession. That strikes me as we're in a period of time in which we're going to have to decide which direction we want to go in. And I want to appeal to that uh, as a populist matter against the, uh, the elites which are dominant. And I think the way to do that, according in our own history, the way it's always happened is by looking back to what are our core principles, appealing to those things. That's the source of American unity. Uh, not the kind of uh, kind of enforced unity coming from government. Yeah, yeah. Well, we can agree on that. We can agree on that. Okay, Matthew, it's been great talking to you. I'm sorry about the appalling internet. Um, uh, everyone, if you've enjoyed this podcast, do please sponsor me on on Patreon or Subscribestar. And thank you very much, um, Professor Matthew Spaulding. Um, I hope to meet you in in the flesh sometime, if we're allowed out of uh, this. I love to. And I enjoyed it and. Uh, had a great time, James, and anytime. Love to love to join you. Great. Thanks a lot. Bye bye.